If you have a Bible with you, whether it's electronic or printed version, turn with me today to Romans chapter 12. We're continuing our series called Changing Your Social Status. And this series deals a little bit with uh, social media and the internet, but it deals with principles of relationships and friendships and uh, a lot of different things going on in our culture and our world today. You know, one of the, the unique things about our society today, I was in an event yesterday morning, I had the privilege of uh, praying for those the council members here in Warren that were being sworn into office and our, our church treasurer who was renewed uh, for a second term. And it's always an honor to be at an event like that. And uh, it was funny. They said, you know, if anybody wants to take pictures at the end and everybody kind of posed, but everybody's a photographer these days, right? Because every one of us, we, we all have a camera, camera in just about every pocket. I mean, I remember the day when I got my first camera as a kid, it was kind of a special thing, you know, and I had to go out and you had to buy film and you had to buy flash cubes or bulbs or whatever it was. And you didn't take a picture unless you wanted to pay for that thing to be processed, you know, because it costs money to process that film. You had to take it to the drugstore, to Photomat. Anybody remember those old Photomat little booths that used to be in a parking lot or whatever? And sometimes you take a picture and because you were conservative, because it costs money to, to produce them and print them and all that, it might be a couple months before you actually got to see that picture because you had a roll of 16 or 24 exposure film and some of the younger people are going, what in the world are you talking about? But uh, that's the way it was back then. But today, there are 2.5 billion cameras, billion with a B, in circulation, and it's revolutionized the photo industry. You know, there was a day when you thought camera, you thought Kodak or Nikon, or now you, you think uh, iPhone, you know, or Samsung, or whatever it is that's in your pocket. Some, some folks don't even know who Kodak is. I read this uh, stat this week, and uh, it, it blew me away. 10% of the photos ever taken in the history of mankind were taken in the last year. 10% of the photos ever taken in the history of mankind were taken just in the last year because of the development of how many people now have cameras and pictures. And you don't care. I mean, like yesterday at the event that people were posing and I'm snap, 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 snap. You know, back in the days of film, you'd be like, all right, everybody get together. Everybody smile. No, you're not smiling. You'd, you'd wait for just that right because you didn't want to take too many pictures of the same thing. But uh, we'd snap 20 or 30 and then go through and delete a few later on. Romans chapter 12 Starting in verse 1, the New Living Translation says, So dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all that he's done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind he will find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship him. Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. Another translation says, don't be transformed into the image of this world. And I want to talk to you this morning about images. The first blank there in your outline is the power of images. You know, images are becoming the universal language today. You go uh, to find a bathroom and they don't even put ladies and men's anymore. They just put an image on there for you to know which one to use. There are, 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 are images uh, on your car to know which side your, your gas tank is on. A lot of people don't even know that. But, you know, if you look at the little gas icon on your car, there's usually an arrow. So you know which side to fill it on. There's all kinds of images that steer and guide our lives. We're led by emojis and memes and, 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 and different signs that, you know, on the side of the road, they, they don't even put words anymore because of all the different developing uh, diversity that we have in our world and our culture. So we're using images for everything. You're a person that posts on social media or on the internet, or even if you write an article for a magazine. Anything that's posted with an image, an article, is 94% more likely to be read because there's an image attached to it. I'm that kind of person, man. Give me a book with no pictures, and I'm like, yeah, I don't know. Give me some pictures. I want, I want some pictures in that book, you know? And so images are a powerful thing. If you're posting on Facebook, Facebook posts with pictures are 35% more likely to be engaged in some way, whether it's a like or a comment or, or even a view. So images uh, are something that are powerful in our world today, something that, that cause us to be more uh, accepting of things, to act on things more uh, frequently. 
And the second commandment that God spoke way back in Exodus chapter 20 even dealt with images. You know, God knows everything. He's eternal. He foresees things that are going to happen thousands of years down the road. It says in verse 4 of Exodus 20, it says, You must not make for yourself an idol of any kind or an image of anything in the heavens or on the earth or in the sea. Don't make any image into an idol is what the Lord is saying here. That images are not to become idols in our lives, but yet, whether we know it or not, there's so many of us that make idols. Not all images are healthy for us. They're not all healthy images. Many times our social media culture today creates kind of a, an alter ego. That's the second blank there in your outline for, for many people. What do you mean by that, Pastor? An alter ego is a second self. It's uh, some side of you that's opposite of the personality that you let other people see. And an alter ego it can even be a fictional character. And so many people, what they post on social media, what they post on Instagram or Facebook or whatever, is it, it, just the side of them that they want everybody to see. But there's a whole other side of them. You know, Jesus had a disciple that was Thomas, and Thomas was a doubter, and they called him by a nickname. The nickname was Didymus, and the word Didymus means twin. What does that mean? That means that Thomas would act one way around a certain crowd in a certain culture, but he would act completely different around a different crowd in a different culture, and that became his nickname. You know, Thomas, you're, 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 you're a two different people. You, you're not the same person in, in all different contexts of your life. And I find that there are a lot of people like that, that when we come to church, we know how to say God and praise the Lord and glory, hallelujah. And when we go in other places like our home or our school or our work, there are different words that we use, words that we're not proud of, words that we don't want other people to see or know about. God hates phoniness. God wants you to be you. God wants you to be real. And so social media has created this whole culture of, of phoniness. Uh, a lot of our teenagers today are creating what they call a, a Finsta, which is a fake Instagram. And it's, it's something that they don't want their parents to know about. And they create it and they just invite their very close circle of friends to be their friends, to view what they put there. They certainly don't want their pastor to see it. I saw something on somebody's Instagram today, and I was going to deal with it, and I thought, you know, I just let it go, Pastor. But, uh, you know, there's a side of us that the people closest to us really know, and everybody else doesn't know that person because they know a different person. God knows every side of you. He knows the inside and the outside. And so this is the problem with social media, is you only see the part of their life that they want you to see. And many times it's the best part of their life. It's the celebrations, it's the vacations, it's the smiles, it's, it's all those things that, that uh, would make us jealous in, in, in some ways. And uh, the, the block of junk that they don't want you to see, they don't post it and they don't show it. They, they block those things. You know, you, you don't see, you see the, the picture where everybody's smiling, but you don't see the argument that happened right before the picture was taken, right? <laughs> Or they delete all the other crappy, uh, crummy pictures, excuse me, <laughs> where somebody was making bunny ears over their head or something like that. And so uh, we, we just let people see the part of us that we want them to see. I want to show you a quick clip from the, the movie Shrek, and it kind of illustrates this, and how sometimes many of us, we hide behind a mask, and social media is great at creating a mask for people to hide behind. Go ahead, guys, roll that clip. A little unorthodox, I'll admit, but thy deed is great and thine heart is pure. I am eternally in your debt. <coughs> and where would a brave knight be without his noble steed? All right, I hope you heard that. She called me a noble steed. She think I'm a steed? <laughs> the battle is won. You may remove your helmet, good sir knight. Ah, uh, no. <laughs> Why not? I. I have helmet hair. Please, I would look upon the face of my rescuer. Oh, no, you wouldn't, Durst. But how will you kiss me? What? That wasn't in the job description. Maybe it's a perk. No, it's destiny. 
Oh, you must know how it goes. A princess locked in a tower and beset by a dragon is rescued by a brave knight. And then they share true love's first kiss. Hmm? With Shrek? You think, wait, 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 you think that Shrek is your true love? Well, yes. <laughs> you think Shrek is your true love? <laughs> what is so funny? <laughs> Let's just say I'm not your type, okay? Of course you are. You're my rescuer. Now, now remove your helmet. Look, I really don't think this is a good idea. Just take off the helmet. I'm not going to. Take it off. No! Now! Okay, easy. As you command, your highness. You're a... an ogre. Oh, you're expecting Prince Charming. Well, yes, actually. And so this is a lot of what we struggle with in life is we're trying to keep up with the Joneses, but we don't really get the right picture of what it looks like to be the Joneses. We only get to see what they allow us to see. We only get to see that best part that they post out there or that the, the little tip of the iceberg that they allow to uh, peak above the surface. And you find yourself competing with something that doesn't really exist. Amen? Amen. You know, a lot of times uh, that's, that's what's developed in our world today is this competition. We want to have what they have. We want to be like they are. We want to, to enjoy what they enjoy. And we see something that is a false reality, an alter ego. We see a facade. We see somebody through a, a, a mask, and we don't see the struggle. We don't see the hurt. We don't see the pain. It's one of the things I've been enjoying about uh, our circle that I'm leading with our, our young adults, on, uh, our, our young couples on Wednesday, is that I get an opportunity to share with them some of the struggles of being in a relationship, of having a, a partner, a life partner, a person that uh, Lynn and I have been married for 33 years, and a lot of times people think, oh, Pastor, you've got the perfect marriage, and you guys don't understand what we're going through, and you don't know what it is like to, to have the struggles. And I get an opportunity to share with them, yeah, I go through some of the same struggles. We have some of the same issues and some of the same problems and, and things like that. And, you know, that's an encouragement to people because sometimes we're trying to strive for this, this reality that, that isn't a reality at all. This thing that doesn't even exist. We think that we've got to be like this image that's placed in front of us in our life when that image is something that's been put through all these different filters, right? You know, that's one of the things with your camera phones these days is everybody wants to apply a filter on that. And so even when you're looking at that image, it isn't what it really appears to be. It isn't even what the image looked like when they took the picture. But people are able to change it and manipulate it and Photoshop it and, and turn it into something that it really isn't. I looked at somebody's post this week, and it was like God gave me this little nugget to share with you today because it fell right in line with my sermon. But one of my Facebook friends actually posted this this week on their Facebook site. She said, I wish I had the money that half these people on Facebook have. And I had to say, wow, is that the impression that we give people that you know, when we go on a vacation that we're loaded with money or that when we take a picture of something that God blessed us with, that, that we've got all this money. But that's the reality because nobody posts the bill when it comes in. <laughs> nobody shows you the credit card debt that they're in. Nobody shows you how far behind they are on their house payment. They, nobody posts that go, you know, look at this. <laughs> I went to the bank and they said my balance was outstanding and I was so excited about that. No, that's not a good thing to have your balance outstanding, you know? Some people just don't understand. We don't often see the struggles, and we don't often see the pain. And if people post that on social media, we, we block them or we hide it. We don't want that drama in our life. Number three, pursuing images can create an identity crisis in our life. We don't even know who we are. We don't even know what image we're supposed to be like and, and, and what we're pursuing is not, like I said, it's not the reality. There's a, a new fear in the world that has developed over the last 20 years with this explosion of images and social media. And it's called FOMO, FOMO, which is the fear of missing out. 
the fear of missing out. And this is really the heart of my message today because it has affected us in so many different ways. It's affected the church. It's affected believers. It's affected our commitment to God. So many people used to be so dedicated to God, and, and, and 40, 50 years ago, 30 years ago even, people uh, didn't think of missing out a, a, a church on a Sunday morning because the Bible says to honor the Sabbath and to keep it holy. And so many people, not only Sunday morning, but they went Sunday night and Wednesday night, and they were involved in a prayer meeting or something else during the week. But then all of a sudden, we started getting all these pictures and these images of all these other things that everybody else was doing. And we started to say, well, you know, I'd like to get involved in that. And, and, and what am I missing out on by, by serving God? And, 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 and what, what else can I get involved in? And so in the last 20 years, we've gotten so involved in so many different things that are going on in the world today because we're afraid that somebody else is, is being happier than us. Somebody else is, is, is experiencing things that we'll never experience. So there's things out there that the opportunities that maybe that our kids are missing out on or that we're missing out on or, 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 or things that somebody else maybe has a leg up on us that they're enjoying that, that we want to enjoy too. And can I tell you something? You're missing out on the greatest transformation of your life. You're wishing, not missing out on the greatest blessing and that's experiencing the presence of God in worship. You're missing out on the, the power of God and the joy of God and the love of God that happens every time we get together to worship. The devil is a liar, and the Bible says he masquerades as an angel of light, and he'll put these images in front of our face and to make us think we're missing out on something and to draw us away to something that is not real, something that is phony, something that is of a false sense of joy and a false sense of, of hope and a false sense of acceptance, and we're missing out on the true love and grace and mercy and acceptance of God. We want to know what everybody else is doing. And that's what social media does. It feeds this. It feeds that addiction. It's really become an addiction. That's why people text while they're driving because they're afraid of, of you know, somebody's talking to me. I don't want to miss what they're saying. And so they're, they're afraid of missing a conversation or missing some type of news or missing what somebody wants to communicate to them. And it's really changed our world that social connection is more important than our own life. My wife's amen and over there. I think it even started back with call waiting. We're afraid we're going to miss a call, so let's get call waiting. We don't want to miss that person. If they call in, we have this fear of missing out. When you see photos that are posted on Instagram of a family vacation in Cancun and maybe you weren't included or invited or award presentations or people at Disney while you're sitting here in 20 degrees and it's snowing or friends at the Super Bowl. There's this thing that raises up inside of you going, why can't I have that life? Why, why can't I enjoy that? What, what am I missing out on? And it plays on our selfish nature and you feel left out and you begin to think that your life stinks and everybody else has it better than you. And it begins to attack your self-esteem and it begins to attack your confidence and it begins to attack who you are. Pictures of people out on a date while you're sitting home by yourself. People getting married when you've been waiting for that person for years. People having babies and, 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 and you've been trying. And all of these things feed that fear of missing out, of missing out on something. I read an article this week that asked the question, how many times a day do you check your phone? I'm guilty. I probably a couple hundred at least. Why? Because I'm afraid I'm going to miss out on something. I'm afraid I'm going to get an email and have an opportunity to do something and I missed it. I'm afraid that somebody's going to send me something and if I don't read it in time. This is a serious fear. The Bible says God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and love and a sound mind. This FOMO, fear of missing out, it drives us to hyperactivity. We're so active today because we're afraid of missing out on something. Not uncommon for people to be out to 11, 12, younger people, 2, 3, 4 in the morning. They're afraid of missing out. I got up yesterday morning. Sam's Club was having a sale. I was in line at 6 o'clock. I was afraid of missing out. 
on something. And as we look at all of these images and we see all of these false realities that we think we're competing with, there's a phrase that comes to so many people's minds, I don't fit in. You know, I've heard that a lot lately. I don't fit in. Why? Because you think that your life is so different from everybody else's, but you're not seeing the reality that is going on in everybody else's life. You only look at your struggles and your desperation and your hurt and, and, and your bills and, and your broken relationships and your pain, and nobody seems to post an image of that or, or show you a picture of that in their life. And so you think, nobody's going through what I'm going through. Come on, don't tell me you haven't had that thought. Nobody struggles like I struggle. Nobody has it as hard as I have it. Nobody's been through what I've been through. I've heard that so many times. Well, you're a pastor. You wouldn't understand pressure and stress. Are you kidding me? <laughs> Everybody loves you, Pastor. Au contraire, mon frère. <laughs> Everybody doesn't love their pastor. But when everybody else's life looks perfect, you feel like you don't fit in. You're trying to measure up to an ideal that doesn't exist, that's had filter after filter applied to it. And you don't realize you're competing with something that's not real. Many of the people that you think are perfect are struggling just like you're struggling. They're struggling in their relationships. They're struggling with stress. They're struggling with their money. But see, that's the problem with this current social world. We don't really get to know each other because we don't really communicate with each other. Images are not communication. Come on now. You think because you post a picture or an emoji or, or a meme that you're really communicating with somebody. You're really not. We get this, like I said, I use this over and over, but this false reality because our communication is just through images. Images and texts, they, they can't create an understanding of the heart behind that picture, behind those words. You sometimes have to sit down and have a face-to-face -face conversation with people to really heal the, hear their hurt and hear their pain and understand what they're going through. This is what God wants for us. Social media is not sociable. The word sociable means inclined to seek or enjoy companionship. Social media doesn't seek companionship. It just seeks information. Amen. It doesn't seek a relationship. It just seeks to, to know what's going on. Where are you at? What are you doing? I'm afraid I'm going to miss out on something. This is drastically and radically changing our world. To be sociable means to be marked by friendliness or a pleasant relationship. And so we have all this activity, but activity is not accomplishment. Sometimes we think because I'm so active and I, I'm not missing out on this. And, you know, we, every day my, my, my social media gives me a, a message telling me who's going to certain events. So-and-so is interested in this event happening today. And this one's going to this event near you. And, and you know what that's designed to do is, hey, you're missing out on this. Somebody's going to something you're not going to. And you know what it's also done is it's watered down our commitment. People don't commit to anything anymore ahead of time because they're afraid if I tell you I'm going Friday night to this comedy show, something might pop up on Thursday that I'd rather go to. And so I don't want to buy a ticket because I'm afraid I'm going to miss out on something else if I commit to this. And people don't want to commit to being involved or to volunteering or, or to being a part of something uh, eternal and significant like, like church life or, or something like that because I'm afraid I might miss out on something else. The most important thing that you want to be afraid of missing out on is an eternal life with God through Jesus Christ. That's the only thing we should be afraid of missing out on. Everything else has no significant value 
to eternity in our life. But yet all these other things draw us away from our relationship with God and our time with God. And we want to capture all that activity on our phone through a picture. You know, I've realized, and this has happened to me and maybe it's happened to some of you, is some of the greatest moments of my life I didn't really see because I was looking at it through this. My kid's graduation. I've got a video of, of Sterling graduating from Wayne State University, but I really didn't get to enjoy it and experience it because I wanted it on an image. I wanted to capture it. Even weddings, things that are so significant. The birth of both of our children, I watched through a lens of a video camera. <laughs> and you know what? I, I never even went, we, we haven't really gone back and watched it even to this day, almost 30 years later. But that's the world we live in because images have become so powerful and important to us. We were designed, yes, thank you, Spencer. Spencer's texting me as I'm preaching today. <laughs> I was watching one of his baseball games one time, and uh, I'm filming him batting because I'm trying to help him with his swing. And so I'm focused in on him at the plate, and he hits the ball, and it goes over the fence, but I never saw it because I'm focused on his swing. And I'm catching it on an image. And everybody starts cheering, and I'm like, what, what, what happened? <laughs> I missed it. The Bible says in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 26, God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. Our world's filled with images that we measure ourselves by. These images influence our decisions and often guide our lives. Images of, in a magazine, we look at to decide what kind of clothes we want to wear or what kind of car we want to drive. Images on television, the way we want to wear our hair, and what kind of type of person or body style that we want, those type of things. God created the world to be dominated by His image. I read this verse this week, and I've read it probably a hundred times, and God said, read it this way. So as we read it, normally we say that God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the seas and over the birds of the air. And every time I read that, I thought the them referred to man. And this way, week, I read it this way. Let us make man in our image and according to our likeness and let them have dominion. Let our image and our likeness have dominion over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air and every living thing. I read that and I thought, wow, God, I never saw it that way. That God wants His image to be the image that dominates your life. Don't be conformed, our text this morning said, to the image of this world, but be transformed by the way you think. Be transformed by thinking about God's image and God's likeness. The world will tell you you don't fit in if you don't wear these jeans. I remember as a kid growing up, there was, you know, the designer jeans came out and everybody had to have that designer label and name. Jordash, yeah. The Jordash look, you know. And uh, my mom and dad were raising five kids and dad was a self-employed barber at the time and I got plain pocket jeans from J.C. Penney, or even tough skins when I was younger, you know? And, uh, you know, I'd kind of walk around school like this, you know? I didn't want anybody to see what, 
what label was on the back of my jeans because that wasn't the image that everybody said you had to be like. There's an image out there that the world tells you you have to be. And it's not real. It's a false image. God created you to be made in His image and His likeness. Don't be conformed to what the world says you should be. The world says, oh, you don't want to be one of them Jesus freaks. And I like to look at them and say, well, whose freak are you? Right. <laughs> I don't mind being a Jesus freak. You're, you're a freak for somebody. I'd rather be one for Jesus than somebody else. It's amazing how God can completely transform a person's life. I was watching the news this morning, and Kanye West is conducting a church service this morning. I can't remember where it was at, but leading worship, people were just going crazy like we were here this morning, worshiping Jesus, preaching a message. His life has been radically, completely transformed by the power of God. And now he wants to run for president. We'll see how that goes. <laughs> We are transformed into this image by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, that's your last blank, will transform us into God's image. 2 Corinthians 3.18 says, We all with unveiled face, I like that, like Shrek took that helmet off. Take the, the, the veil off of your face. The world wants to put a veil on your face. What do you mean by that, Pastor? When Moses went up to get the commandments from God, he was in the presence and the glory of God for such a length of time that it made an impression upon him. And when he came down from the mountain, the image of God was burned into his face. What do you mean by that, Pastor? I mean that he glowed. There was this, this light that was shining out of him. So bright that the people, they couldn't stand to look at it. They were like, Moses, man, put something over your face. We can't even look at you. The Bible says to shine your light into this world. We get that light from being in the presence of God. And when you're in the presence of God, you begin to absorb it. It begins to change you and transform you into his image. And the world, they don't want to hear about God. They don't want to see how happy you are and how much love radiates out of you and, and, and the peace that comes upon your life. And they'll say, look, man, you can't, you can't be like that. Here, here, have a drink or have a drug or have, have something, man. Let's, let's, let's go do something. We, you, you're just not right. When the reality of it is the image of the world is the wrong image. Who was a company that had that? Advertising slogan, image is everything. And that's what the world believes, but they're chasing the wrong image. He goes on and he says, With unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, we are transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. So if the goal is to be dominated by the image of God, how do we get dominated by the image of God? Just like Moses, be in His presence. When you're in the presence of God, it says here that you experience the glory of God and you'll be changed into His image from glory to glory to glory to glory. You know, as a pastor, obviously, and I said this last week, the thing that I want most out of everything in life is to see you come every Sunday and worship God. Why? Because our vision is for your life to be transformed into His image. And it happens every time you're in the glory of His presence. And the more often I can get you in the presence of His glory, the more I can see God begin to change and transform your life. And the problem is, you'll come <clears throat> once and, and, and the, God will begin to make an impression on you and then you go back out into the world for six weeks and the world is making an impression upon you. And it changes who you are. And then the glory of God will come upon you and you, you begin to look like Jesus, but then you go back out into the world for another five or six weeks and you begin to conform to their image. And you're becoming that Thomas, that Didymus, that person that has these two realities going on in life and one really isn't real. When God wants you to be one image, His image, 
He wants to tattoo His image on your heart. And it's the fire of God in worship that creates this image. The image of God has nothing to do with the physical exterior, unlike every image that the world puts in front of you. It's an image of mercy, an image of grace, an image of love and compassion, an image of healing, comfort, encouragement, peace, joy, all these different things that God wants to put in you and let it come out of you to change the world. Bow your heads with me this morning. Hallelujah. I pray this message, Lord, has touched somebody in a way that will significantly significantly alter the course of their life. That they won't leave here today and go, well, that was a good message and, and do nothing about it. Nothing changes. But God, I pray that they'll become a doer of this word, as you say, and not just a hearer of it, Lord. That they'll take this truth, this principle, and apply it to their life, Lord. And God, that they'll begin to pursue your image and your likeness above all else. And all these things that we fear missing out on are keeping us from the one thing we should fear missing out on. And that's what you're doing, what you're saying. That's an experience and an encounter with you that we should fear missing out on that glory to glory that happens when we worship you, that will truly change us and transform us into your image and your likeness, Lord. God, I pray if there's anyone here today that is chasing an image, trying to keep up with something that feels like they don't fit in, that feels like they're missing out, that's become so active in so many things but accomplishing nothing of eternal value and consequence. God, I pray that you'll convince them in their heart today of their need to make a major change and that they will open their heart and accept you and embrace you and give you and you alone control of their life, that your image and your likeness will have dominion over them. Well, heads are bowed and people are praying. If that's you today, you say, Pastor, I am unhappy with my life. I don't feel like I measure up. I, I do feel like everybody else has it so much better than me. And what's wrong with me? What's going on? And I've been looking for fulfillment and satisfaction in so many activities, but I feel like I'm getting nowhere. I want to surrender to God today. I want to tell you that true satisfaction, true fulfillment can only come through a relationship with God. And that relationship with God can only come through Jesus Christ. And you've been running from that because you're afraid of missing out on something else. I, I did that. It took me several months to give my life to the Lord. God had been dealing with me, and I was afraid if I committed to God that there was all these other things that I'd miss out on. And everything that I was afraid of missing out on, God had for me, and even better. It was greater and better and more fulfilling than everything the world had to offer. Don't be conformed to the image of this world but let God change you today. If that's you, you say, Pastor, that's me. I want to I make a change today. I want to change the direction of my life. I want to make a commitment to live for God and to pursue His image today. Well, heads are bowed. People are praying for you because we love you and we care about you. I'm going to ask you to take one step of faith. Just lift your hand up. You can put it right back down. Pastor, that's me. Amen. I see your hand. You can put it right back down. That's me, Pastor. I need God in my life today. I need God today. I want His joy and His peace and His love. His image is the only true image. We're going to say a prayer right now, and I'm going to ask everybody in the building to say this prayer for your benefit so that you're not praying it alone. But if you're praying this for the first time today, I want you to say it from the depth of your heart. God is going to meet you right where you're at today if you open your heart and pour it out to Him. 
Let's all say this together. Say, God, I open my heart today and I give it to you. I have chased after so many things that have left me empty. I have pursued an image that has left a void in my life. Today I make a commitment to pursue you. I ask you to forgive me for putting other things above you. That is sin and idolatry. Today I make you the God of my life, the center of my life, and I commit to serve you, to pursue you from this day forward with everything that's within me. I ask for your strength, your mercy, and your grace to be what you called me to be, to be dominated by your image and your likeness. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Let's give God praise this morning.